Welcome to Presence, a global conversation for a new earth with hosts Doug King and Cody Deese. And hello, everybody, and welcome back again. And welcome to the month of February. It is now February of 2020, and I've got to share something personal with you about my life. I'm getting older. And so is Cody Dees, who's also with me. But still, Cody, you're getting older. But the cool thing about hanging with me is you're a young dude. Well, it does make me feel really good about it myself. To. It should. <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Hang around me. I'm going to make you feel good for a lot of reasons. It's getting, uh, yeah, it, it, it's the, the, I noticed that my, I told my wife this the other day. Um, now it's like where we live at like 6 p.m. or 6.30. It's, yeah. it's still a little bit lighter out. Yeah, it is. So you're starting to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an exciting thing because yeah. we love like we like spring and summer oh, where yeah. it's like late till like oh, 9 p.m. Light right. till 9 p.m. You're, you're beach people. Well, we are. Yeah. Very much like Danae, my wife. Uh, Danae is also a beach person and loves summer, her favorite months. And to her, life is shorts and flip flops. Mm-hmm. That's a great lifestyle. That's a good time. Yeah. A lot of good times. So we're headed that way. But each season, there are people out there right now that love to snow ski and they love mountains and they love all that comes with that, too. So I guess we'll have to um, allow that to continue to exist. OK, Doug King. Yeah, we are working through your Woo! dad's book. Woo. <laughs> hey, and by the way, I didn't tell you this, but I yeah. uh, was on a phone call with mom and dad. Uh, just so everyone out there listening, I get questions about them all the time. They're doing well where they are in an assisted living facility in Northeast Ohio with a lot of family up there. And dad uh, has been listening to all these podcasts and it told me th- to let you know that he feels like we're doing an outstanding job with his material, which is always a nice thing to know since we are basing this old podcast series on irrevocable so at least we know there's one person that likes it (laughs) well max king if you're listening hello i hope you're well and uh seriously um thank you for uh your work and the book and uh just being able to pour yourself into a written word like that it's been fantastic series i've loved it yeah it's been excellent and again we've we've been in a pretty technical uh study Right now, uh, going through Irrevocable, it's really an academically written book. You look at the bibliography, it's all the full of uh, many theologians who've wrestled with uh, exegetical problems through time. So you get into a lot of technical material here, but all of that is kind of like the engineering nuts and bolts of a deep, deep dive. Again, I compare it to the Golden Gate Bridge. Somewhere there's engineers that know every nut and bolt and the and the deep complexity of what it took to build that bridge, but 90% of the world just wants to jump in their convertible and drive across it um, and doesn't want to know. For those of you that have hung in there and are real interested in exegesis and the interpretation of what we think is God's story, uh, we're really glad that you've done that with us. And from here, once we get done with this, as we said last week, we're going to go on to some other subjects that are probably more based on current conversations um, that are happening out there as well. But we need to end uh, like in the next podcast or two with yeah. it, that doxology, that like triumphant, yes. glorious, like for like all the artists and musicians uh, I'm dealing with people all the time. They're just like, I don't know what to write about music anymore. And da, da, da. I'm like, it's a pretty good one that Paul does right here. <laughs> it's a that's a brilliant idea. That's a brilliant idea because, uh, no bones about it. We as we read Romans nine, ten, and eleven, uh, see that Paul is a universalist. Oh yeah, and I know that term is loaded and heavy and just sure. hot, sure. but it's uh. It's evident from specifically Romans 11 of what Paul was attempting to show these Gentiles um, who had made uh, their faith a requirement. Yes. And Paul just, man, Romans 11 specifically just presses the gas on the vehicle. And and that's the beauty is he ends it with this just triumphant like it's. Honestly, Romans 11, it's a beautiful text. It's a beautiful text. And when you talk about universalism, well, I absolutely am seeing that as God's story. And yet here I am studying 
the scripture. I would consider my form of contemplation, Cody, to be what is called Lectio Divina, which uh, is a form of contemplation where you're literally meditating on the text. You're literally meditating on scripture. I do that constantly. I spend so much of my life doing that. And as a fundamentalist, I would have said, you know, 40 years ago, I would have said, well, uh, this universalism, I guess you're saying you can just go do anything you want. Well, here's what's interesting. What I want is to meditate and grow deeper in my understanding of this amazing God that has done this amazing work and completed this amazing story. And so my universalism, so to speak, is not something that led me to get rid of Jesus, get rid of the biblical narrative, to not worry about morals and ethics or the way my marriage goes or my parenting. It's the exact opposite. It's driven me, Cody, to spend more and more time in reflection and contemplation about what my life is really all about. Okay, I want to take a technical pause for a second. And we can use this recording or not yeah. use this recording. It's totally okay. fine. But Matt okay. listened to the first episode and, and said that the popping's even worse. So, no way. yeah. So, for our listeners, if we hang on to this podcast, um, we are aware of it. So, but uh, we didn't, when we did our test, we didn't hear it. We did not. No. So, I'm saying he can cut this out. I want to, but I say we roll. All right, let's do it. And, <laughs> and we promise that after this will be the last time you hear the popping, we're going to get this solved. Absolutely. Okay. Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? This is the question that Paul starts with. And then here it is. Certainly not. I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about this finalizing or concept of casting out. We got into it a few episodes ago, but I really want to kind of complete Paul's thought process as he opens with that question in Romans 11. Yes. It's interesting that he says with regard to uh, has God cast away his people? He said, I also, I'm one of them. I'm your apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles, and I am them. I am one of unbelieving Israel. He's identifying himself uh, with the very people that are being rejected by Gentile followers. And Paul identifies with the Israelites after Abraham's seed, after the seed of Abraham, tribe of Benjamin, because this is the seed according to the flesh. And Paul references this identity after the flesh when he points out his uh, genealogy with the tribe of Benjamin. So he's just basically saying, look, I am one of the group that you are rejecting at this point. And we need to remember that Paul was found on the road to Damascus in the middle of unbelief, in the middle of persecuting faith, not just, oh, Paul didn't have faith when he was found. Paul persecuted the faith. He was a persecutor of the faith. And so here you have, what did Paul do to deserve God appearing to him on the road to Damascus? Not a thing. The mercy of God was being shown to somebody who was found in disobedience. He has found all under disobedience that he might have mercy upon all. And Paul was absolutely found in in disobedience. This is exactly why Paul was the perfect emissary for this mission to the Gentiles. He was perfect because he was a representative of unbelieving Israel and the mercy that God was going to show toward them. He starts by showing this mercy toward one Paul who symbolizes unbelieving Israel the whole, and he extends this mercy so Paul can go to the Gentiles and say, by the way, this is the nature of the God that you're supposed to have faith in, and this is the nature of spirituality that your faith is supposed to point to. This is the God, not the God who would find me on the road to Damascus and say, we want you cast out and and that to be the final story, which is what the what the Gentiles were saying. So Paul um, was uh, found 
without uh, faith in Christ. Absolutely. And yeah. obviously this is uh, the part of the large problem here with the unbelieving Israel. That was Paul. The question is, Paul has this experience, right, which we've talked about before on this road, and the scales fall from his eyes is mm-hmm. what the text says. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> Does Paul have any specific requirements or checks off the list in that? Uh, and we even use the word conversion per se, if that makes any sense. So at some point, Paul right. goes from yeah. uh, no faith of Christ, no faith in Christ. He, he is, if you were using the dualistic labels, he is unbelieving Israel. He's mm-hmm. following the law. Yeah. And then at some point, he shifts over. And to the point where it's as if the Gentiles, which Paul is writing to, would be like, yeah, no, Paul, Paul gets this because he also has faith. But you're saying Paul never made faith a requirement. No, because, number one, Paul was not chosen by God to be one of the apostles on the basis of faith. He instead was chosen by God to be this apostle when he was unfaithful. We also remember that, you know, Paul spent three days uh, in blindness. He spent three days in, quote, I might use the term outer darkness. Uh, This outer darkness was obviously serving to give Paul time to then receive God's revelation or reflect or come to some type of enlightenment that moved him out of that darkness. When he comes out of those three days of outer darkness, he comes out an enlightened person. And this is the story of the narrative. It's not that you uh, knuckle under to the requirement. It's not that, no, Paul, you're going to be saved if you respond to the altar call. Paul, you're going to be saved if you get in there and get baptized and then live this kind of a life. No, this was, again, the story of awakening. And this is the biblical narrative uh, Paul's going to say later in chapter 13, now is the time to awaken. It's high time that we awaken. This is the whole point of God. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the revelation of Jesus Christ? Not the requirement of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is being used by God to reveal the true nature of identity. And so, There was no requirement. There was only an awakening that happened with Paul so he could go do this role and function as an apostle to the Gentiles. So, um, and yet at the same time, Paul has this great sorrow and anguish, Romans 9, 1, that we saw for unbelieving Israel because he knew God had not appeared to them in that way at that time. But Paul is saying, look, it's not just me that God has found under disobedience and then had mercy upon. I'm just the prelude to the nation being found in unbelief and disobedience, and God will have mercy upon them. That, again, this is the end result of God's work. So, yeah, that's uh, that's what I would say about Paul's conversion, so to speak. I was at a wedding yesterday, mm-hmm. and uh, we we got into this. Uh, a few of us standing around and we got into this conversation and something struck me um, as I was there because a large part of the conversation, Doug, was uh, most of the people around that table that I was at had come from a uh, like fundamentalist um, blue meme traditional, um, probably I would even say, uh, yeah, it's fair to say unhealthy blue meme. Um, stage of consciousness. Yep. Yep. And uh, they were talking about the fundamentalism that they were rescued from. Mm -hmm. But what was transpiring was uh, now that they've come out of that, kind of made their way through modernity, and then uh, they find themselves in kind of that postmodern type uh, space. And they're experiencing, a lot of them for the first time, uh, fundamentalism on the uh, left side, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, So like, uh, what I think Ken Wilber calls mean green, um, which yeah. is uh, it, in some ways that it was interesting. The conversation that they were saying was, 
yeah, I'd rather have the fundamentalism on the right than the left. Mm. And they got into just their own personal experiences and yeah. stories of yeah. being publicly dragged and destroyed yeah. uh, by the fundamentalism on the left. Yes. Whereas the fundamentalism on the right was a bit more private. Uh, it was a bit more tribal. Yes. But it wasn't necessarily public per se. You got trashed by your own church <laughs> and the right. The right fundamentalists get, tr- they yes. trash their own people within their own church. So, so the conversation yeah. at the table began began to be, yeah, um, that a, a lot of people, uh, m- uh, many people don't change their beliefs, uh, like their beliefs change, but they don't change how they believe. And what we mean by that is it's as if you move from a fundamentalism on the right to a fundamentalism on the left. Absolutely. And it's just as toxic. It, yeah. It's just as unhealthy. Yes. And I was, I was listening to them and it suddenly dawned on me, and here's where I'm going with this. This is what Paul is talking about. That's it. Paul is is in some ways yeah. not to, you know, again, I'm careful with the bridge from an ancient world to a contemporary world. But in some ways, Paul is saying you have a law, Bible following, Torah following group of people that the progressives of the day, the Gentiles have said these guys are. Are they abide by the law? So you would call them legalistic. They're fundamentalist. They are interpreting the Bible in unhealthy ways. And now you have all the way over here on the right these free Gentile progressives that are saying, and that's just not the way it is. It's faith in Christ. But, and this is where Paul steps in, and this is the integral framework of what's so interesting. He's coming from a higher space. And I don't mean that in an arrogant, like, Way I I mean you have to understand he's he you can feel what he's doing in the letter he's mm. coming into their context to say okay and for those that'll be like yeah this is the problem higher stage of consciousness if we'll just think about um what Einstein said about consciousness no problem can be solved by the same level of consciousness that created it no problem can be solved by the same level of consciousness that created it Paul has seen something that's it on the Damascus Road Paul has seen something. And he comes in with that vision, with that massive, immense gospel, and he says, okay, Gentiles, I see you fundamentalists to the left, and I see you fundamentalists to the right. And what I'm trying to tell you is not stay in the middle. You know, everybody's like, you just need to be, (laughs) you you need to be, uh, you know, a little more balanced, like you hear that. Paul right. shreds all that. Paul's just exactly. like, no, no, I'm not interested in left. Yeah. I'm not interested in right. I'm not right. interested in balance. Yeah. I'm talking about that the people on the right have not, they've changed what they believe, but they are, they have not changed how they believe. It is the same fundamentalism on both sides. And I'm trying to tell you there are no requirements. It yeah. is a universal message of acceptance. Yes. And both groups can't handle that. Right. No, I mean, this is and that's because when you come like Paul did from that integral perspective, which he brought in after that uh, revelatory experience on the Damascus Road, when you come in with that, you are coming in from a perspective that is the next perspective beyond the progressives who are still saying, yeah, but there still is a requirement. You still need to be a Christian. You still need to be in religion, or you still need to do this to be saved. He's actually coming in beyond the the postmodern, and that is the integral perspective that is beyond postmodernism. And this is why it's so controversial today. Uh, what we're saying is because even the progressive Christians are still saying, but you've got to be a Christian. You've got to accept Christ. And they're studying the same story we are, but they're interpreting Paul and saying, oh, by the way, the fundamentalists have got Paul all wrong. And we're asking the question, is it possible that the pro- progressives have also uh, gotten Paul wrong? Is it possible that it's time for us to, again, elevate our perspective of what God was doing through Christ? Okay, what were we talking about? Casting out? Casting out. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think that covers it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I what I'd really like to do is get into this thing of uh, what happens after the casting out and what the purpose of the casting outs for. Right. I mean, at this point, he's saying and th- this is where you get into verse 12, chapter 11, Cody, that if their fall, the fall of unbelieving Israel is riches for the world, that's riches for you Gentiles. Now, think about that. 
the role and function of Israel's fall was to bring riches to the Gentiles. And if their failure uh, also brings riches to the Gentiles, uh, how much more their fullness? So first, I would just want, like us hit the point here that there's a role and function of, of the unbelieving side of God's story, of the condemnation wrath side of God. It's to say, it's to say it all plays a role and function. And so there is a message that never would have gone out to the Gentiles if first Israel hadn't rejected it. And there's Paul and Barnabas over in Acts chapter 13, and they're talking to the Jerusalem Jews, and they're talking to them about Jesus and moving into Jesus and so forth, and they're absolutely getting nowhere, being accused of blasphemy, et cetera, et cetera, apostate, you know, what you would expect. And so they make this statement, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, you Jews, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, we turn to the Gentiles. So what Paul is saying is, look, I had this experience in Jerusalem and I told the Jews in Jerusalem, I'm coming to the Gentiles. I'm coming to you all because they rejected the message. They didn't want to hear anything else about it. And because they didn't want to hear anything about it, that's their failure, their fall, their unbelief is actually the reason you ended up hearing about Jesus is because we come to you out of that. It was first offered to them. So there's a, there's a um, benefit to you that comes through that side of this story uh, of condemnation and rejection. And then the, the other thing I wanted to bring up, Cody, was this idea of what is the fullness of Israel mean? It, you know, failure and stumbling or bringing riches, then how much more their fullness? What, what, what does he mean even more than their failure, even more than their stumbling? Th their fullness is even more than that. More what? Well, this is where dad gets into uh, Romans eleven twelve from the standpoint of what Paul has written elsewhere as in 1 Thessalonians 2, where Paul says about the unbelieving Jews that um, they have both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, they persecuted us, they do not please God, are contrary to all men, forget, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, so as to fill up the measure of their sins— to fill up the measure of their sins was Israel's fullness. How much more their fullness will bring riches is Israel was filling up the fullness of the operation of sin that came as a result of law. When the law was added, sin increased, and Israel is, through her rejection of Jesus, filling up the measure of sin. And Paul says the wrath of God is coming upon them to the uttermost. Now, why is that a benefit for God's wrath to come upon Israel? Because God's going to remove the things that stand as identity markers for that world of unbelieving Israel. Therefore, their temple's going to go away, their high priest, their priesthood, their genealogy, all of those things that have been their identifying markers are going to be removed, not so that we put a period there, but they're going to be removed so that then there can be acceptance. And that's why right after Paul has written this, Cody, where he says, you know, what, how much more their fullness will, will bring, he says, um, just imagine then if their failure, their fall, and the fullness of God's wrath coming upon them has brought good things to you. Do you not understand how spectacular the results of his acceptance are going to be that follows the wrath? His acceptance is going to be what brings, Paul says, life from the dead, that the Gentiles are not going to participate in life from the dead or an understanding of life from the dead, they're not going to appreciate acceptance until they understand that after the casting out, God's acceptance is a sign that he finds Israel completely powerless, just as he found Jesus in the tomb. He finds Israel completely powerless to do a darn thing about their God identity from the standpoint of doing. 
and he accepts them on the basis of his power, not theirs. And that was to be the purpose of the Gentile faith. I find it really uh, interesting, just uh, like group dynamics for a minute, that you have a group like the Gentiles, and I don't want to paint with too broad of a stroke here, but um, they are the original outsiders. These are the ones on the outside uh, of the of the faith, outside of the margins of the edges. Um, they're Gentiles. Oh, and they're on the outside by nature of their birth, which is interesting. They didn't choose to be born Gentiles. They were just born. Okay. Then it's as if they all of a sudden, because of unbelieving Israel, this is what you're saying, because of their unbelief, Paul now shifts and turns to the Gentiles to, hang with it, full inclusion, <laughs> like you are included as well. Right. And then this group that were outsiders are now insiders, but then they make this message um, a message of exclusivity. That is that is interesting to me. And that's I think that's human nature. One of the things I've often thought about as far as our instinctual nature and and what we what we find satisfaction in through the in, through the instinct of self is always that we in some way or another establish our safety and security by looking at and finding someone else who doesn't have the same safety and security in some way or another that plays itself out. It can play itself out in how much money you have. It can play itself out in a lot of different areas. And in this case, it's playing itself out into I'm okay with God, you're not. And it's that human instinct I think Jesus was getting at when he told the parable of the guy who had a debt that was impossible to pay. He could not pay it. He was thrown in prison and therefore in debtor's prison. He had no way to pay it. And yet the king calls him forward and says, I'm going to forgive you of this um, debt that is impossible for you to pay. And the, and the guy's ecstatic and, and, and he's so thankful. And he immediately goes out and he finds someone that owes him a small amount. And he he wants to choke that guy to death and have him thrown in prison. And Jesus is saying, this is the, mm. this is a human instinctive thing. You turn right around and the very same situation that you're in, when you have a chance to show grace to other people, you have a, a chance to show acceptance to other people and mercy and kindness. You want to turn around and give them condemnation and put a period at the end of it. And I think that's Jesus talking about our human nature. Amen, Pastor. <laughs> that's a good word, Doug. Well, thank you. It's so true. It is so true. And I think that's true for all of us, right? I mean, the the, yeah. the instinctual nature, as you said, we are both the 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 sheep and the goats. Yes. Uh, Adam and Abraham both run inside of us. Yes. And so when we say these things, we say these things as being a part of that club. <laughs> right. And there is this uh, duality of the most beautiful word I've ever heard, Romans 11. At the same time, there is, it's the most, oh, how would I word it? Um, just frustrating word at the simultaneous time that it's the most beautiful word. And what I mean by that is, we all love an idea of full inclusion, but we all hate the idea of full inclusion. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's it. That's well said. Well said. And, you know, I, again, I go back to the human nature thing, uh, parables of Jesus, etc. I think about his uh, parable of uh, building house on a sand versus on the rock. And this is our human nature uh, that. All through my life, I'm to use that kind of principle, that parable that Jesus taught, to decide what am I doing in my relationships? Um, what am I doing in my marriage? Are, are the things I'm putting into this thing sand or am I building something on rock? And on we go and, and discipline within my own life or where I want to be or, or what I've got my sights set on. And the great thing is, is I know that I've, I've got God's arm around my shoulder at all times 
uh, saying, I accept you, I love you. And when you discover your true identity, you will work through those things and you will find yourself building more on the rock than on the sand. Okay. Well, well, obviously we are landing the plane. We are in the final descent. Uh, We need to talk about Remnant. So that'll come up. And then we need to talk about this doxology at the end and how he really nails this thing. So again, let me apologize for the technical issues. We are aware of it. We're working on it and we will be back with a clean signal next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at info at presence.tv. You can also visit our website at presence.tv or find us on Facebook. We look forward to hearing from you.